Over the past couple of years, eight conservation NGOs, Ministry of Forestry, have all come together and conducted the most comprehensive, most up-to-date, Sumatra-wide survey for tigers. Two key results that came out of this is the importance of Carinchi for the long-term survival of tigers and the importance of Ache. And it's just so heartening to be working in these landscapes. We're constantly bombarded in the media about the dramatic decline of tigers disappearing from national parks, uh, going extinct in entire countries, but yet in Carinchi we're finding the tiger numbers are actually increasing. Sumatra is an incredible place, it has one of the richest biodiversities in the world and it has tigers. If we're going to conserve tigers anywhere in Asia, Sumatra has to be the place. I'm constantly amazed that people in Sumatra, they're, they're still living at the forest edge, they're living with wild Sumatran tigers, this large carnivore that occasionally comes out and kills a goat or kills a cow or injures a human but yet there's a, a level of tolerance here and they haven't wiped tigers out they're not hunting them at the high levels you might get elsewhere in Indochina for example the people that we work with they have they have an understanding of the tiger here and it, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to explain but they have a, a, a spiritual connection with the tiger and I do feel that's important for allowing them to understand the tiger and to coexist with the tiger. Living with tigers brings its own set of challenges and something that we need to do working in Sumatra is making sure that people aren't suffering unnecessary losses with tigers so it could be making sure that at night they're penning in their goats and if they are penning in their goats we've helped them to build a livestock pen that a tiger then can't penetrate if it comes into the village at night. To conserve tigers, we simply have to stop the forest habitat loss. And there's no one agency that can do this on their own. It's got to be a range of actors. You've got to have the communities involved. You've got to have the government law enforcement agencies involved with the mandates and powers of arrest. And you've got to have the conservation NGOs involved like FFI that can build that capacity that enables them to do that. So in, in Carinchi, the, the approach that's taken there is a robust law enforcement response to tackle the poaching, to tackle the illegal logging. It's building the capacity of the government rangers, getting them involved with the community partners and jointly tackling these threats. And you're finding now in some of the areas that the poaching is actually decreasing. In Aceh, the, the approach we take is slightly different. It's, you, you've got to bear in mind the, the history of Aceh. It's just come out of 30 years of civil conflict. It's been through one of the worst natural disasters in recent memory. Uh, the people have suffered a lot here. A hard law enforcement response isn't going to work with the communities here. We need to look at how we can empower the communities and get them involved in protecting tigers. So, one of the approaches that we've taken is to set up this community ranger program. And it's key to give the communities this real sense of ownership. The rangers are from the communities, they're elected by the communities and they're there to serve the communities. A unique and key feature of the Community Ranger Programme is that they're either ex-combatants, ex-illegal loggers or ex-wildlife poachers. What FFI does is it offers them sustainable, environmentally friendly employment opportunities. The positive transformation of these Community Rangers has just been incredible. Within a year they've become one of FFI's key partners in conserving tigers in Aceh. One of our best Community Rangers is the oldest Community Ranger, Norman Bin Chuk. He's an ex-combatant. We first met him in the middle of the forest drying out Samba deer meat, one of the key tiger prey species. He didn't want to do this, but he didn't have an alternative. So we offered him the chance to become a community ranger and he's just excelled the whole way through the program. I've been working on tiger conservation projects in Sumatra for about 12 years now. The majority of times in the jungle and in all that time I've never even seen a wild Sumatran tiger. So we set camera traps out, we check them every two weeks, leave them in the forest when you get the tiger photo in the camera trap, that's why it's all worth it.
partnership between FFI and WWF. Um, it's in about its 32nd year now, and I think it's shown some success. Um, I'm going to name the daughter from um, Ruka from the Asimbi group, um, and I'm going to name her Hobe. Hobe. Hobe is a Rwandan race, and I chose it because it reminded me of the way that the Rwandan people and the government have embraced the mountain birds, those magnificent creatures, and made their conservation a world success. It's also my special privilege and pleasure to introduce another person, a person who is a well-known global broadcaster, naturalist, and presenter. He's a global superstar, and he's the biggest living advocate of mountain gorilla conservation. I introduce you to now to Sir David Attenborough. Thank you. To Rwanda nearly 40 years ago, and then saw mountain gorillas for the first time. What marvelous animals they are. But they were in great trouble at that time. There were only about 400 of them. Poaching was rife. The forests in which they live were threatened and getting smaller and smaller. Since then, the conservation movement to help the gorillas has grown and grown and grown. An example to the whole world of what can be done if you really care. There have been lots of troubles in between then and now, which you might have thought would have risk in fact the entire survival of the Mount Gorillas. On the contrary, today there are over twice as many in the world as there were when I was with you. So it is indeed a privilege to bestow a name on one of the new arrivals. His name is Nshung, which I'm told means replacement or blessing. For the old Gorilla, the old lady who produced it, had had several babies before, but had then not produced any other for several years. And people thought that maybe she was past childbearing. Not at all. When Shongo has arrived, all blessing on you. Sumatra in Western Indonesia is home to some of the world's most diverse and most threatened tropical forests. Fauna and Flora International is working with local partners, including NGO Lembaga Tiga Baradik, to test an innovative community-based approach to forest conservation in a particularly vulnerable forest block in the buffer zone of the world-renowned Kerinci Sablat National Park. These forests are home to a multitude of threatened plant and animal species, such as the Sumatran clouded leopard, Malay sun bear, thousands of birds, reptiles and amphibians, and the king of the jungle, the Sumatran tiger. Kerinci Sablat and its surrounding forests are home to the largest remaining population of this critically endangered big cat. These forests are vital in mitigating global climate change, as standing forests store carbon and release oxygen. Protecting the watersheds is also extremely important, as these forests store and feed into rivers and streams that supply fresh water to millions of people. However, these forests are under increasing threat from illegal logging and allocation of natural forest to plantation concessions such as pulp and paper and oil palm. The result is reduced water quality and supply, an increase in natural disasters such as landslides, loss of unique wildlife habitat and species decline and dramatically increasing carbon emissions. Communities dwell at the fringes of the forest, living in small forest edge villages where they are dependent on forest resources. Their rural economies are primarily agriculture based, producing cash crops such as rubber, cinnamon, coffee and fruits such as durian that are traded at local markets, while river caught fish provide essential additional protein in their diets. Local people are the key to long-term protection and sustainable management of these forests. 
their lives, traditional culture and economies are intimately linked to the forest. Fauna and Flora International and Lembaga Tigaburadic are currently working with eight villages in Morangin district, supporting them to establish recognised village forests that provide legal infrastructure and local capacity for forest protection and management, as well as helping local communities to access greater benefits from their forest estate. Here, some of our partners explain the importance of village forests. Dengan berdaya masyarakat lokal, berarti kan mereka sudah punya konsep kedepannya nantinya mereka butuh kawasan hutan. Apalagi saat ini kita melihat kayu aja sudah susah, di mana-mana terjadi bencana alam, jadi mereka sangat peduli memelihara kawasan hutan tersebut. Membangun advokasi hutan desa di wilayah buffer zone Taman Nasional Kerinci Seblat juga adalah salah satu fungsinya untuk melestarikan daerah aliran sungai. Karena daerah das-das yang ada di wilayah hulu Kabupaten Merangin dan Sarulangun itu bermuara ke dasnya Batang Hari Jambi dan itu dimanfaatkan jutaan orang untuk menikmati airnya dan ini wajib dilestarikan. There are many steps in the journey to facilitating successful village forests. A critical first step is clarification and legalization of community rights to access and manage forest resources, or forest tenure. Activities include supporting people to map their village and forest boundaries, which is essential to support the legal process to secure tenure of these areas, through village forest license approval from the National Forestry Department. This requires boundaries to be documented, agreed between villages, and physically mapped and marked in the field. This can be a challenging process, requiring community members to learn new skills, involving lots of teamwork and negotiating difficult terrain. Another critical step is to support communities to quantify the environmental, social and economic values of their village forests. In June 2011, Community members from the villages in the project area participated in a five-day training course to learn about high conservation value forest assessment. And with support from Fauna and Flora International Specialists, are now gathering mammal, bird, reptile, amphibian, botany and biomass data from their own village areas. With access to this information, communities will be able to develop strong village forest management plans and will also be empowered to participate in community-led Red Plus, or reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation, and play a critical role in tackling climate change. Ultimately, communities should be receiving rewards for the vital role they play in protecting forests and the ecosystem services they provide. Opportunities are increasing for payments for such efforts, particularly in relation to carbon. Those communities that have legally recognized tenure of their forest resource areas and a strong understanding of the natural values of their forests will be those that are best placed to access these benefits through a community carbon model. The time to act is now, to ensure that the next generation knows life with forest, not without. Semoga cepat mengeluarkan oh, SK Hutan Desa Kalau keluar SK itu otomatis kami tenang, tenang, nah, tenang. Tidak ada lagi ancaman dari misalnya PT, pengusaha ataupun CP maupun dari tetangga sebelah. Untuk selanjutnya bisa masyarakat lebih tenang, lebih kuat untuk mengelola maupun menjaga hutan yang ada di desa setelah ada dari Keputusan dari Pak Menteri. Fauna and Flora International, Lembaga Tigabradic, and other local partners continue our journey with these communities and others in neighboring Sarulangun district to build local forest management capacity, support communities to demonstrate their contribution to mitigating global climate change, and maximize the benefits they receive for sustainable forest management and protection.
and ensure that the king of the jungle continues to roam free in Sumatra's forests. The need for land, for livelihood, can be overwhelming to the cost of biodiversity. But it need not be like that. Flower Valley in South Africa is a case in point. A few years ago, a large swathe of wilderness known as Finbos, richer in plant diversity than the rainforest, was destined to be cleared for wine production. FFI bought the land, returned it in trust to the local people and set up a valuable enterprise based on sustainable harvest for the cut flower trade. The staff are now paid a year-round fair wage. Projects like this require dedicated investment to set up, but their success is a real endorsement of our strategy. We came first here three years ago. We had two alternatives, two choices. We can approach this problem, bringing people with arms, closing the, the, the beach and uh, keeping all the people that has used this beach for a long time out of the beach. Or we can start a big process with other people in order to achieve sustainability. The first alternative is and possible for us because uh, we don't have uh, the enforcement power. We are not a governmental agency. So we started protecting the leatherbacks that are the species which is critical and danger. Uh, we, we had success. We, we are protecting maybe between the 95% and the 100% of the nets in this beach uh, with the collaboration of the community. At the same time, we protect some of the olive riddle eggs, where we can't protect all of them, even if we have the capacity of enforcement. Uh, we have to see in this as a long process, a long-term process. And one of the key activities we have to see is education. And we have to work with key in order to show that there is another way of have a relationship with this species. These people know that, that sea turtles are so important for them. They, they want to keep the sea turtles. Uh, people here are very poor and sea turtles are, has been an income source for them. So it's so difficult to take the sea turtles uh, use off from them and say continue living. You have to bring them alternative livelihoods. And this is one of the most important things if, if you want to achieve sustainable conservation for these animals. Uh, in this process we have to be so creative, we have to bring a specialist, we have to ask to the people, we have to work together with, with other organizations, a lot of stakeholders, trying to uh, build together this alternative and to, and to give to the people another activity which they can appropriate as their uh, income source.
Yep. Uh, a bit higher. Probably like right what up. The Siamese crocodiles has, have these extra, extra row of nuchal shields above their, their plate of six and uh, the saltwater crocodiles are just smooth across this section of their body. So you can see those, those extra, extra nuchal shields there.
The pit itself is formed from the wood mostly. Water lock will keep them not decomposed. So when it drain, some decomposer come and the depth will influence the carbon. So the deeper the pit will be more carbon. One meter a pit will maintain about 600 to 700 ton per hectare. It stayed there for a thousand years up until people come and disturb it. Ya, hutan desa juga sebenarnya sebagai medium untuk bagaimana mereka pertama merebut hak bahwa mereka punya hak untuk mengelola desa, hutan di desanya. Semua sepakat bahwa memang <tuh> hutan desa menjadi sebuah alat baik itu dalam memberikan hak kepada masyarakat, baik itu dalam mengantisipasi ketika RDD diimplementasikan ataupun karbon trap berjalan di, di Indonesia sebenarnya. Kematang Gadung Forest is the last forest block remaining in the southern part of Ketapang. So I'm very curious to find what species inhabit in that forest. This is the endangered turtle species, the spiny turtle. Uh, they usually found in pit swamp forest. Yeah, might be we will find this species in Pematanggado. Yeah. There are more than a hundred species of bird and endangered mammalia, like orangutans, bekantan and gibbons. I think everybody is the important organization because they they give us the the understanding about how to make our dream about the forest conservation to, to come true. And now we know that the Pitchworm Forest here in my village have the high carbon. Ya, untuk pelatihan HCV uh, memang untuk tahap pertama itu di tiga desa di Pematang Gadung, Sungai Besar, dan Sungai Pelang. Masing-masing desa itu ada kita latih tujuh orang. Dan masing-masing orang spesifikasi pada bidang masing-masing, seperti misalnya mamalia, reptor, botani, kemudian gambut, juga dari sisi sosial, ekonomi, budaya. Sehingga nanti mereka bisa melakukan penilaian HCV di desanya masing-masing. Sangat peduli karena hutan adalah tempat dari mana segala hewan, contohnya saja seperti mamalia, burung dan lain-lainnya. Menurut saya FFI sangat bagus program FFI supaya hutan dan binatang supaya bisa listari untuk kedepannya.
Hello, I'm Stephen Fry, and I want to talk to you for a little moment just about uh, uh, Fauna and Flora International, and especially in relation to their work in Australia, and how, as Australians, uh, you can help FFI and understand the kind of work it's doing and uh, contribute to it. It's um, probably pretty well known by now that our planet is in trouble, and as Australians, you will be aware that there are some of your remarkable, unique species, both of fauna and flora, i.e. of wildlife in all its forms, that are under deep, deep threat. Um, and this is for all kinds of reasons. And there are all kinds of ways of approaching it. But it seems to me the most sensible one is one that embraces the sense of conservation of whole habitats and most particularly embraces the understanding that no animal species, no plant species, no ecosystem is ever going to survive without the cooperation of the people who live and work in it. And that really is what FFI specializes in. It understands that you can't ring fence a piece of land and keep humans out. That what, what you can do is give humans a sense of the immense value that the whole ecosystem gives to them and make them understand that the survival of one species contributes to our own prosperity and survival. And I know as Australians around the world have had uh, an enormous impact. They've punched, as so often they do in sport, well above their weight in terms of their contribution to the global effort. And I think FFI is all about local and global issues. And if you can contribute in some way to an effort that embraces a full understanding and a full appreciation of conservation as, as a life's work for all of us, for our generation, I know that if I'm ever going to be proud of myself, it will be not in terms of a career, in television or in writing or in acting or in anything of that nature. It will be in whether I did anything that made a difference uh, for future generations. It may sound a little bit pompous and self-regarding, but hey, I'm, I'm old enough to be that now. And uh, I would say that probably deep in your deepest heart, you too feel that the best you can do for the world is to ensure its prosperous, happy, biodiverse future for the generations yet to come. So thanks for thinking of FFI, and thanks for thinking, as Australians, how you can do your bit to help both God's own country and the whole wide world. There are lots of not-for-profit organisations and charities that specialise in wildlife and in conservation. The reason I was drawn to FFI, I think, is the unique blend of, of deep understanding and good science and its concentration on small projects around the world which actively and completely engage local populations. There is a history in FFI of the projects causing greater prosperity for fishing populations, farming populations around the world, whose livelihoods depend, yes, on getting and spending as all humans do, but also now through tourism and through enriching their own um, habitat uh, on, on the wildlife that had been endangered around them. So rather than spending my time uh, helping individual charities that might concentrate on one species or another, or on huge ones with unwieldy bu bureaucracies, I, I found FFI exactly suited my sense of how conservation was going to work in the future. It's a great honour for me to be taking part in this naming ceremony, and I'm only sorry that I can't do so uh, in person. I first came uh, to Rwanda nearly 40 years ago and then saw mountain gorillas for the first time. What marvellous animals they are. But they were in great trouble at that time. There were only about 400 of them. Poaching was rife. The forests in which they live were threatened and getting smaller and smaller. Since then, the conservation movement to help the gorillas has grown and grown and grown. An example to the whole world of what can be done if you really care. There have been lots of troubles in between then and now, which you might have thought would have risked, in fact, the entire survival of the mountain gorillas. On the contrary, today there are over twice as many in the world as there were when I was with you. So it is indeed a privilege to bestow a name on one of the new arrivals. His name is Unshongo, which I'm told means replacement or blessing. For the old gorilla, the old lady who produced it, had had several babies before, but had then not produced any other 
for several years and people thought that maybe she was past childbearing. Not at all. Unshongo has arrived. All blessing on you. Dragonierova, kui zari elev spune bas. Zari eli spune ba, chuen zari eli samgaroa. Tau pikrdet. Are you ready? Kenlin, Callum, Bola, Gerbanda. Garing in the name, I judge a mobile honor. Garing in the name, I judge a mobile honor. A guy, a man, my line guy. A guy, a man, my the younger people have the, a lot of the skills with the, with the technology of today and um, with them using their te this, this technology what we got here now and uh, with the elder people providing the stories and it should go down well because uh, then you can get the younger people interviewing their grandparents or their parents or their uncles and aunties and I, I, th I think they'd get more information if, if, it, uh, if it was family, interviewing family. Well, my purpose to come along was to learn a bit more about still photography. A lot of our history was handed down by word of mouth. And e even the way we learn things, it's, it's, um, it's, it's more a hands-on, a show, show, show us how you do it and I'll do it, you know, rather than sitting down with a piece of paper or a book or instructions and trying to learn things like that. We, we are very visual people and when we're showing things, we learn it quicker. Press record. Did I press record? It's going to um, improve our um, knowledge. It's going to give us um, um, a, a connection of how we can start learning to teach the younger generation and it's all about sharing because that's what we're all about. We're caring and we share a lot of our knowledge that we learn throughout our day to day. I feel that it's helped me a lot with um, how to work a lot of the um, up-to-date and digital recording equipment. This has really um, opened my eyes and it you know, has really helped me now that I can actually start to do a program in the future to do some interviews and stuff now with the children and um, do some documentaries hopefully. Yeah well I've learnt a lot about recording like audio and how to use the equipment because I'm doing research and having those technical skills can help me in my research for um, collecting data and keeping a record of it. All right, cameras rolling. Three, two, one. Well, I feel a lot more confident now with um, the video equipment and that and doing videos and made you feel more comfortable and relaxed with the equipment and it's not as hard as it really all seemed like before. Yeah, a bit more, a lot more familiar with it, even though it's only been a short time. The video camera, that's what I came along to learn that. I understand it a lot more. You know, it's easily easy to get the booklet with it, but you can never read that. I can never read or understand it. It's got to be someone has to tell me how to use it, go through it with me, and I'll understand it more. All this technology today is a part of our lives. 
was a highlight for me because I actually got to learn how to take some of the shots from day one and dragging them onto the laptop screen we're in Movie Maker, which was something I never knew. History was handed down by word of mouth. My name is Irene McBride, a descendant of the Butchler tribe who used to live around here. And where we are situated now, before this botanical garden was created, it was just all natural bush and the traditional owners used to camp over here. There was plenty of food, bush tucker here for them. In the creek, it sort of flows over there, you could get the abbeys. And there was mullet here, but they wouldn't touch it because they said it, it tasted muddy. What they used to eat, but they, they preferred the diamond scale mullet. So every winter when uh, they're on the boat harbour, they'd be sitting up in the cypress pine trees and waiting, looking for the mullet to come in. This one here, like it's going to flower in the coming weeks. It's going to flower. It'll have a little green flower on it. But that's okay. Look, it's got some flowers now. But that's okay. The flower is quite insignificant. But when the Aboriginal people were walking past here today and saw that, they were they would have talked about how the oysters will one day be fat. This is the oyster bush. But when the seed pods become red, that's in late July, early August, the people from this area and beyond would now start to make their walk to those big midden heaps you see on the coast for the oysters, the pippies, the ugaries, the crabs, because when they get there, all that is now fat. And this, a bush like that will be the calendar to say, let's start walking. My name's Nene Bird, and I'm sitting here today at Nguyen Point, and it's to do some knowledge recording for my family um, so that I don't have to repeat this. This information was privy to me from Aunty Olga Miller, the last Kabunya and Keeper of Records, and uh, she was also the last matriarch of the Wandana people. Way back in pre-contact times, there were six clans on this island. It's projects like this that give our elders an incentive to seek how we can help our youth to connect back to country, but it's also opening up doors to get the youth to understand how important it is for them to connect back to country too. Thank <laughs> you.
Angkor Wat's massive temples rose from the plains and rice fields of northeast Cambodia around 1,200 years ago. Elephants did the heavy lifting here. Their efforts are immortalized in stone. According to Khmer culture in Cambodia, people have an intimate relationship with elephants. In Buddhism, elephants are revered even more. Toy Saravatina first developed his devotion to elephants, growing up in a tiny rural village after his family fled the genocidal Khmer Rouge army. Today he's often called Uncle Elephant for his tireless work helping to protect these magnificent creatures. Only about 250 elephants still live in Cambodia's wilderness, but their future is increasingly endangered, mainly in agrarian communities. Our project reduces human elephant conflict and studies the migration and number of elephants. This is a good migration place for wild elephants, known as a hot spot. They can cross the river because the water is shallow and the rocks on the bottom are flat. Batina and his group traveled to the edge of the elephant forest habitat to organize the rural communities and devise creative solutions to prevent human-elephant conflict caused when elephants raid farm fields for food. To help mitigate this damage in the future, we'll, we'll recruit between 10 and 12 community members to take on responsibility for guarding their crops. We'll give them basic training in crop protection, how they can build watchtowers around their plantations. The tower behind me is for our team members to keep a close watch for the elephants, to know when they are coming into the fields. And then we organize efforts to scare the elephants away. This is an electric wire notification system. When elephants walk in, their trunks will touch the wire and get a mild shock. This scares the elephants. If they get used to it, they will walk in and touch the second wire. This will create a loud noise, waking up people on the tower to chase them away. Vatana and his team have also helped build community schools and developed a conservation curriculum for the youngest generation of locals, including how to grow crops that can be harvested quickly before elephants know they're ripe. Vatana helped us by providing vegetable seeds and the power tiller, which reduces the cutting down of trees, which are homes to wild elephants. The strategy has paid off. Since 2005, not a single wild elephant has been killed in Cambodia due to human conflict. It's an unprecedented achievement. <laughs> I was once a hunter of elephants, until I met Mr. Vatana. He educated me, and I eventually volunteered to work for the preservation of wild elephants. There is room for elephants and people, but people have to live with tolerance of that. And that hopefully is, 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 is Vatana, and that project's role is encouraging people to be more tolerant if wildlife is to continue to exist. I mean, I want to see harmony between people and wild elephants. My country is being constantly developed these days. So I hope that the development and the preservation will proceed simultaneously and our natural resources will remain sustainable. For outstanding environmental achievement in Asia, the 2010 Goldman Environmental Prize is awarded to Toy Zaravatana, Nam Pen, Cambodia.
Northern white rhinos once roamed in large numbers throughout North Central Africa. Now they are on the brink of extinction. There are only eight animals that we know of in total in existence. Eight animals, that's it. The rhinos are the victims of unforgiving poachers. Their dire situation created by a black market trade of their horns. It's worth about two and a half times the price of gold on the black market. And it's used in medicines, it's used for making dagger handles. All of these things make that rhino highly desirable. In a desperate last ditch effort to save the rhinos from extinction, four of the eight remaining rhinos have been relocated from a Czech Republic zoo back to their natural habitat in Kenya, where it's hoped they will breed. We've tried everything in captivity to get them breeding. It's not working for a whole range of reasons. This is the last chance for the most rare large mammal on Earth to actually survive. The rhinos will be heavily guarded by game scouts 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The rarest large mammal on Earth is going to need a lot of protection. So the hard yards actually really begin now. It's hoped the program will beat the odds and over the next 30 years we'll see the creation of a viable breeding environment, saving the rhino from a once certain doom. It can work, you've just got to make sure everything's in place for them. The community on the ground in Kenya want these rhinos back. They remember rhinos from their grandparents' time. If it wasn't for their enthusiasm and their passion for their own wildlife, none of this would happen. We started by choosing the best areas for lynx and for rabbit and after we've done that we've, we've started contract, uh, contacts I mean, with, with landowners, managers, hunters so that we would have potential uh, people, local people to work with us through management agreements in order to promote the conservation of, of the habitats and to allow the recovery of rabbit. Those management agreements are uh, worked together with the people I've mentioned, the managers, the landowners, in such a way that they will make the current management of the estates and the hunting zones compatible with the conservation of habitats and indirectly the conservation of Iberian lynx. In 2003, everybody had given up. The state declared that they found no evidence of Iberian lynx in Portugal. From that time, we've come to a position today when we actually have 16 lynx in a captive breeding centre in Portugal. That's something up in, in FFI. Um, we did, we, it was because, I'm, I'm sure, it was because of us and the, all the pressure we did in the lobbying uh, that the Portuguese government uh, felt it was a duty for them also to, to carry on this work. There's been a whole turnaround in attitude. Uh, the government are much more engaged in links conservation. Local people in the areas where we've been working for the last five years are very much engaged and very much aware of the links uh, and its habitat, because habitat's been a key focus of the conservation effort. We've got around 12,000 hectares of Good quality links habitat now secured under management agreements. That work facilitated by FFI through LPN. Our approach is to when the links program arrives in an area is to talk with the landowners and try to convince them that this model of, of, of cons uh, nature conservation and development is, is good. Uh, but so far it it was the Lynx program that arrived and talked to the people. Now we are starting to have landowners that are coming to us 
and they say, well, I know of someone who did this with you, we liked it, we'd like to try it with you. This is the main example of how things are going well. In future, I think that we should look at reintroduction as one more tool at our disposal for conserving links. But uh, I think we should never forget that, and first of all, we have to conserve and preserve the habitats because this is the beginning of everything and the end also. The lynx is a flagship for the Mediterranean habitat, so if you have the lynx, it's a way of telling that this habitat is important. But not only this, that the lynx being present allows for the habitat, this kind of habitat, the Mediterranean habitat, which is a traditional habitat, to still be maintained and people gain from it because they, they can have benefits for themselves, rather than agriculture or traditional products, uh, even, for example, cork, which is uh, very important for, for us in Portugal. So by keeping this habitat, you bring benefits to, to the people. So we are not only trying to protect a species, we are trying to help men also. So I would see over the next four to five years our strategy being one of providing backup support to the LPN team, trying to reach across into Spain and if we find an opportunity to stimulate comparable activity on the Spanish side of the Portuguese-Spanish border, linking to the work that's taking place in Portugal. We've always had this vision of, of protecting a corridor of land stretching from southwestern Portugal to central Spain to the core populations of lynx. The core populations that we have in Spain, we need to provide them with the space and the ability to migrate out and to colonize other areas of Spain and Portugal. And I believe that will happen. Very recently, a uh, lynx that has um, a GPS collar and that has been dis dispersing from the Nyana region uh, has dispersed to, to a place very near to, to, po to Portugal border to the uh, Barrancos region border with Andalusia in Spain. Uh, it's according to the Spanish authorities it has been as near as 20 or 30 kilometers from the Portuguese border so <laughs> This is probably a distance that the lynx could do in a couple of days. So, and this is just an example. If one animal can do this, several others could do. And in fact, several others could be right now here as vagrants. The important message and the ecological meaning of this is that we have the chance of having lynxes in our territory. We have the habitat. Now we need to secure that habitat, improve rabbit, improve social acceptance of links uh, and all is uh, at least in theory ready to have again a links population in Portugal. We've been approached by a group of scientists that have been our awareness had been raised about the critical nature of the, the issue with Iberian lynx in Portugal. They're becoming extinct, was the word. Uh, and so FFI pulled together some funds, created a project. And it, it has been a very helpful partnership. In the beginning, it is the, the kind of partnership we think it's the best one, because we never felt FFI uh, came to Portugal uh, thinking that it was an organization bigger than our organization and um, knowing much more than us. We had always this kind of um, relation with space to each one of us giving their own input and understand different point of views. When this program starts, no one was caring about the links in Portugal. It was like a kind of uh, taboo. I would say. There were nothing happening in the field and the FFI approach was really important and the help and the, the skills we could develop. Uh, it was really important to, to start working on the links in Portugal. All the knowledge that FFI has and specific things, uh, they, they may go from communication, how to communicate with people, from how to basically do 
conservancy it's quite important there's that knowledge that we when we get together He's making the most of it, isn't he? Goodness, look at him go. Yeah. I'm sure that's what last night was about, Amy, that he must have... That Um, I have many strange animal encounters, um, and uh, some of them in, induce fear, you know, when, when you're in a tent in the jungle, and just in that stage where you're just tripping, and a, and, a, and a monkey screams in your ear. Admittedly, you're separated by a bit of canvas, or at least nylon, um, but it's, there is no fear quite like it. I mean, it is just simply horrifying. <laughs> it really is a bowel-emptying experience. But... Probably the oddest, simply because, you know, the, almost all the ones that were really extraordinary, I had predicted because I knew I was going to see gorillas, I knew I was going to see chimpanzees and rhinos and tree lions. The amazing to be under a tree and suddenly see there's a lion staring down at you, this particular subspecies or clan of lions in western Uganda in the Queen Elizabeth Park there. I mean, that's extraordinary. And so there were lots of things like that. But the oddest was the wetter, I think. A wetter is a New Zealand um, insect of more than usually repellent aspect. Um, they look <laughs> really horrific, and some of them are very malevolent, or at least they'll they'll bite. And they're, um, but they're in fact one of the biggest and ugliest ones is quite quite friendly. Yeah. And I have one um, crawling around on my arm, um, and it peed on me. <laughs> <laughs> it peed all over me, living up to its name of wetter, uh, <laughs> although it's not spelt like that. Um, and I discovered. And it's just such an interesting discovery that so few people on this planet could ever make that I am allergic to wetter pee. <laughs> I'm allergic to the pee of a rare and endangered insect that only exists in New Zealand. And, and I found that a very exciting moment. I got a little exmatic reaction and scratched and scratched for, for, for the following week. So there you are. I mean, that's, that's not something you'd ever guess would happen. But nothing really compares to the sight of Mark Carmordine's <laughs> nape being um, ravished by a nocturnal parrot of the greatest possible rarity, the rarest parrot species on Earth, of course, the kakapo. That was an amazing sight. And, you know, it has proved very popular on YouTube, and it, 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 the, the parrot in question, Sirocco, has a Facebook page and, and a Twitter uh, identity. It should be a, it should be a squawk um, uh, rather than a Twitter identity. But, uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, it, it has actually helped... Um, a lot of money has poured into the Codfish Island uh, um, group who are, who are, um, um, and to the, to the wider organisation that is supporting them, that is helping the, the population of Kakapo, so that's a good thing. Also, it is a reminder of, of the peculiarity of the bird. The reason it does that is, of course, as you probably know, birds, birds um, imprint 
that are, are imprinted by whoever, as it were, the first thing they see when they come out of the shell is their mummy. And this particular kakapo was hand reared because it was uh, it, it wasn't like all the others, you know, raised as well. So it did think it was um, a human, wow. and that Mark was a rather nice <laughs> Mrs. Kakapo. <laughs> There's certainly memories that you'll never forget. Yeah, I mean, there's, and one is in no position to complain, let's be honest. It is an amazing opportunity to do what I did, um, to, to travel around the world to some of the most beautiful and extraordinary mm -hmm. places in the world, to look at some of the most extraordinary and beautiful animals in the world, and to talk, actually, also to some of the most extraordinary people in the world, because I do think that the point about conservation is that in each place we went, where animals were thriving, it's because there was a group of people, sometimes even just one person, of extraordinary passion and commitment, and tireless, a tireless belief that, that this species could be saved. There was Don Merton in New Zealand, for example, who had started this with his I incredible pioneering work with the Chatham Island black robin, mm. which I, it, it's a, was a bird of such rarity that when he arrived, there was one female, one female that had been fertilized. The males died and it had laid eggs. And that was it, one female, Old Bluey, Old Blue. Old Blue, was, when she died, was mentioned in the New Zealand Parliament. I mean, this was a bird that saved her entire species. I mean, that is unbelievable really is phenomenal and to have stood on Chatham Island and had this black robin one of them fluttering around swooping down taking some worms that we put down for it I mean incredible it can be done even at the at absolutely at the brink when it's two seconds to midnight mm. you can do it but it, it usually takes extraordinary individual commitment and understanding and behind it all always people don't like to hear this well, at least some people don't, but the people who know always know, it should be said, good science. It takes research and knowledge and facts, not guesswork, not blasting in without knowing what's going on. It takes really good science. I think there are, there are a number of reasons why I think uh, Flora and Fauna International is, is, is the organisation that for me I can try and do my best for. Um, one is simply personal and selfish, but I hope you might understand it, and that is that naturally when you're in the public eye a bit and you do things on television, you do get an enormous number of requests. Mm -hmm. and, and I was aware that I was getting um, dozens and dozens of requests in the field of animal welfare and conservation from species-specific uh, organisations and from slightly wider organisations all around the world and I thought <coughs> I'm actually just going to go mad um, and, I and not be able to do anything unless I focus it in, into one organisation and uh, and I just I'm, from the people I met from FFI in Africa and from my knowledge of, of, of the world such as it is of conservation I'd always felt that the reputation of FFI in, around the world for and I, if I say quiet, it's wrong. I don't mean that FFI are um, entirely silent. Their reputation is enormous in the field, but it's not all about ego with them. It is about understanding, I think, for me, the most important thing is the link between the people whose habitat is uh, under discussion and under review because that's where the animals that are, or the plants that, are, that need saving are. It's understanding the link between the people. It's not regarding the people as a sort of parasitic encroachment on a beautiful paradise that should be left alone. It's understanding that if there is a future in conservation, it's very holistic. And I just like the approach. I don't know what else to say. You know, in the end, it's, um, it's if in the big sweet shop of conservation charities and NGOs, you, you, you're just drawn to the one that, that, that makes your survival juices go, and FFI was the one for me. As a boy, I, was, um, I loved wildlife programmes. In the early years then, really, there was a, an Anglia TV series called Survival that I used to watch. And, and I lived about four or five miles away from a wildlife park, and uh, I got a job there once in the in the summer holidays. And I loved 
I loved doing that. Um, I was hopeless at it because um, actually being close up with animals and feeding them and things scares the living bejesus out of me. Animals are very frightening because they, quite rightly, um, are only interested in food and sex and um, making sure that other animals don't threaten them. And humans and animals, it's so easy to get it wrong, you know, and I, I'm not sure I have the patience that truly great zoologists have, but I do love them. And I was incredibly excited by Douglas Adams's uh, work on the original Last Chance to See mm -hmm. book that he wrote with Mark Conwardine. I was living in Douglas's house. I was house sitting for him while he spent a year going around the world doing that. Um, and we were very good friends. And so when the book came out, I read that and I thought, well, God, one day to be able to do that, to travel the world and find these animals would be quite something. And about 10, 15 years ago, I made a documentary about the, um, about the wildlife of Peru mm -hmm. and became terribly interested in the spectacled bear, mm -hmm. um, and, which is the largest mammal of, of South America and very shy and misunderstood and, and, and endangered. And so we went back and made a whole film about just the spectacled bear. And, and that really made me think, this is very good fun. And then when a few years later the BBC agreed that it may be a good idea because the, the Adams family, that sounds silly, but you know what I mean, <laughs> Douglas's family had, had wondered whether maybe a 20 years on mm -hmm. film about Last Chance to See would be good. And I'd been in touch with Mark and he liked the idea. So uh, it happened. That was a very long answer, I'm sorry. Gorillas are truly one of the most charismatic animals, but they are in trouble and need our help. Habitat destruction, poaching and political instability are causing their numbers to decline and they face extinction within our lifetime. Fauna and Flora International and Australia Zoo have a plan to help save the gorilla and you can help. Simply send us your old unwanted mobile phone and help raise much needed funds for gorilla conservation as well as doing your part for the environment. Please answer the call today and help save a gorilla. When we came first here three years ago, we had two alternatives, two choices. We can approach this problem, bringing people with arms, closing the, the, the beach and uh, keeping all the people that has used this beach for a long time out of the beach. Or we can start a big process with other people in order to achieve sustainability. The first alternative is impossible for us because uh, we don't have uh, the enforcement power. We are not a governmental agency. So we started protecting the leatherbacks that are the species which is critical in danger. Uh, we, we had success. We, we are protecting maybe between the 95% and the 100% of the nets in this beach uh, with the collaboration of the community. At the same time, we protect some of the olive riddle eggs, where we can't protect all of them, even if we have the capacity of enforcement. Uh, we have to think in this as a long process, a long-term process. And one of the key activities we have to think is education. And we have to work with key in order to show that there is another way of have a relationship with this species. These people know that, that sea turtles are so important for them. They, they want to keep the sea turtles. Uh, people here are very poor, and sea turtles are, has been an income source for them. So it's so difficult to take the sea turtles' uh, use off from them and say, continue living. You have to bring them alternative livelihoods. And this is one of the most important things if, if you want to achieve sustainable conservation for these animals. Uh, in this process we have to be so creative, we have to bring a specialist, we have to ask to the people, we have to work together with, with other organizations, a lot of stakeholders, trying to uh, build together this alternative and to, and to give to the people another activity which they can appropriate as their uh, income source.
The nursery at YCT helps supply the plant seedlings needed for forest rehabilitation. The replanting of native tree species is especially encouraged. Several horticultural technicians care for these tender shoots in the project's nursery. They also assist with educational outreach work in the wider community. We advise them and we also show them how to do it. And at one point when where training is needed, we bring them here at the Golden Stream Center. We provide training, maybe with sowing of seeds or transplanting and some technical thing that we can do in the class. And also we go out into the field to do some demonstration, especially in nursery construction and management, like maybe pest control and disease control. We also do that in the communities now. One of the Yakshe Trust's core programs is organic cacao farming. The nursery supplies carefully grown cacao seedlings to local farmers. Really the cacao field we have is, uh, is we want to have it like a model so that when we bring in farmers we show them how to keep the shade and also the cacao spacing and different plants we want to incorporate with cacao. We can take them there and show them exactly what kind of cacao field we are looking at. Organic cacao is now a successful and important export crop for southern Belize. Local farmers have achieved remarkable success through a partnering with the Worldwide Fair Trade Network and they have won the endorsement of Green and Black's international buyers. We are telling our farmers that growing cacao is also sustainable if you do it the right way and it's also environmentally safe um, rather than planting citrus, rice on a large scale, you do a lot of clear cutting but when growing cacao you have high canopy shade, you can be planting your mahogany, you can be having your kuhun trees, your mamia apple, where gib nuts, toucan, other wild animals can live among naturally. So the local market for organic cacao is predicted to grow even larger in the near future. So that one is full as well. A new cacao field is described to farmers as being like a new family bank account. It will eventually yield handsome interest, but the capital involved takes a while to build up. Pues, e mas pesi chain to kul ya bili kya ki pka biki na do pes talin to kul mas ka mas 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 inchi desi kaku e poko ibel em takin ab takin mendik don kaheni mas inchi es. Controlling weed growth is also important. Using a machete every three months to clear the new growth of brush is encouraged. Pruning demonstrations are provided to ensure that the young cacao trees will eventually produce a maximum yield. Our planet is facing some of the most daunting challenges in human history. Scientists agree we are losing species faster than ever before and may be reaching a tipping point in the damage we are doing to the Earth. Overexploitation of finite natural resources is damaging ecosystems and threatening the quality of life of millions of people around the world. Meanwhile, climate change is bringing into question the very future of life on Earth. All these are threats to our natural world and therefore to us. Conserving the Earth's biodiversity is fundamental for the health and productivity of the planet, and it has never been more important. There is still much we can do to give life on Earth a chance. We can change the future for the better. Fauna and Flora International is taking action to protect endangered species and ecosystems worldwide. Over the past 100 years, we have helped to ensure a future on this planet for numerous species, including the mountain gorilla, Sumatran tiger and Siger antelope, to name but a few. We've also protected vast swathes of threatened habitat, from a unique floral kingdom in South Africa to Cambodia's enigmatic cardamom mountains. And we've set up new, groundbreaking projects to finance the conservation of some of the world's remaining rainforests. In fact, we now protect over 16 million hectares of irreplaceable habitat. That's an area larger than England. We believe that local people are the best long-term guardians of the natural world, and so we focus our work on helping them to conserve the biodiversity on their own doorsteps. 
Through our work in over 40 countries worldwide, most of which are in the developing world, we are helping communities break out of the cycle of poverty and environmental degradation. We believe this is the only way to achieve conservation that lasts. Despite our achievements and proud history, there is still so much left to save. So we intend to scale up our work over the next five years. By 2013, we plan to have increased the amount of threatened land we have secured by 50%. That means safeguarding another 7 million hectares. As one of the world's oldest conservation charities, we are at the forefront of pioneering new approaches. We intend to play an important role in tackling climate change by keeping precious carbon-storing habitats standing and by developing new and innovative means to finance this. We will continue to work with some of the poorest communities on Earth to help them benefit from conserving the natural world. And we will empower hundreds of partner organisations in the countries we work in to respond to local environmental challenges. Throughout our long and distinguished history, we have always searched for newer and better ways to carry out conservation. In the face of the escalating environmental crisis, this quality will be more important than ever before. In many ways, our journey is only just beginning. We need you with us on that journey and we invite you to join us. I have been a member of FFI since the early 1950s when I produced my first television series, ZooQuest. I chose them because I believed them to be efficient, well-focused and that they would bring help speedily and effectively. They did. In the past century, they have saved species from extinction and protected habitats from destruction. Their solutions have always been practical, efficient and sustainable in local circumstances. If you value the natural world, if you think it should be protected for its own sake as well as humanity's, then please support Fauna and Flora International. Rove McManus is the latest recruit in the late Steve Irwin's army. He's become a wildlife warrior. At Australia Zoo this morning, the Gold Logie winner received far more than just a trophy for his conservation efforts. The Gold Logie nominated funny man has taken on the serious issue of conservation, recently appointed Vice President of Flora and Fauna International. Myself and uh, David Attenborough are the two Vice Presidents. How awesome is that? The annual VIP breakfast at Australia Zoo was attended by Bindi and Robert. She's nearly taller than me. <laughs> the Irwins again rallying support in their fight against bauxite mining on Cape York. Can you help me protect this gorgeous reserve? But the focus was awarding wildlife warriors Rove and Zoo Conservation Manager Giles Clark. Between his television commitments, Rove has spent the last 12 months traveling around the world, visiting FFI's projects in many countries. They do some amazing things with regards to conservation, not just with local wildlife and, and um, areas, but with the local people. He'll be hoping to carry some of that winning fortune on to the Logies next month. Don't you sell that to the women's magazines! <laughs> Emma Dallymore, 10 News. A hundred years ago, when we were founded, 
we were almost alone in our conservation work. In those days, it was taken for granted that the natural world was limitless in its bounty. Extinction was an unfamiliar concept, but as trophy animals became harder to find, our founders came to an uncomfortable conclusion. The game was running out. We began our work by setting up the first great game parks in Africa at Kruger and the Serengeti and in India at Corbett. What started to protect hunting turned by degrees to conservation for the sake of species and the wider environment. We've been talking a lot recently of disappearing species, but four new species of frog have been discovered in the Cardamom Mountains of Cambodia. And they're no ordinary frogs. Oh no, these are green blood and turquoise coloured bones. They were discovered by scientists from Flora and Fauna International. Jenny Daltrey is a senior conservation biologist with the organisation. And you found one of them, Jenny? I did, yes. Good evening. Um, yes, I found one of them that actually looks a little bit, unfortunately not the green turquoise uh, boned frog, but uh, one that looks a little bit like the English common frog, the European common frog. And so if it does look like a common frog, how do you know that perhaps <laughs> you have found something different? Well, the one that I found uh, was distinctive just really because of the call it made and I, and I uh, went to investigate. I mean, actually in the first expedition we carried out, there were only supposed to be nine species of amphibian known in Cambodia. And over the course of the expedition and further surveys, we found 63 species. Wow. So you weren't expecting to find new frogs, as it were? Well, no, not really. We were actually uh, on an expedition to look for all sorts of animals, but um, started finding an awful lot of in interesting amphibians, um, including a frog that glides, a frog that looks like a bird dropping, and, and then this uh, green, green frog with turquoise bones. And how did you discover it had turquoise bones? Well, it's actually somewhat trans transparent. Um, it's quite a small tree frog, and you can actually see the turquoise bones, bones through, the, through the skin. Is that extremely rare? I've never heard of that before. Um, well, it's, we don't know exactly. It was only just discovered last year, and um, so far only about three have ever been found. And the pond in which two of them were first found has been destroyed, so oh. we, we assume it must be a very rare frog indeed. And so will you now take part in conservation work to try and make sure that these frogs, as well as the other animals there, survive? Uh, well, in, absolutely. Um, I mean, our organisation is a conservation organisation and, and we carry out these surveys with the government to help identify which areas to protect and help them to, to set up protected areas. And we're now helping to manage over five million acres of, of rainforest in the Cardamom Mountain. I've seen photographs of these today. You have been able to get them to stay still long enough then for you to be able to photograph them. <laughs> yes, it's a bit tricky, but um, yes, we, we're quite used to handling frogs. And uh, yes, it must drive you on though to to search for other new potential species. Well, well, indeed. I mean, we've actually found as well um, d during the surveys, we found um, new birds. We found uh, I, I found a new snake. Um, we found several new lizards. Um, the surprises keep coming. Um, so, so it's, it's a fascinating area, and it's partly because Cambodia really doesn't have many scientists, and um, very few areas have actually been explored yet. Do you like frogs? I do. I've always liked, liked frogs. <laughs> it I was little growing up, in, and uh, I used to have ponds with frogs, so it's very exciting to go out and see species of frogs that no one has ever seen or recorded before. Very exciting. Thank you very much. That's Jenny Daltrey, who's a senior conservation biologist with FFI. With less than 500 Sumatran tigers left in the wild and more than 50 being killed by poachers every year, it's sadly just a matter of time before this species becomes extinct. Fauna and Flora International are determined not to let that happen, but we need your help urgently. Either visit our website or call the number on your screen and donate whatever you can. And with 85 cents from every dollar going directly to wildlife conservation, giving to Fauna and Flora International is also an investment in the future of our planet. So please give now. Who knows? The money you give could help save one of these guys. Fauna and Flora International are a worldwide charity organisation helping save animals and the habitat they live in. But we need your help. Visit our website or call the number on your screen and give whatever you can today. Help Fauna and Flora International make the world a better place for animals like this. In Europe, we're facing the extinction of one of our only big cats. The Iberian lynx has suffered from habitat destruction, loss of prey, and accidental killing on the road and in traps. Less than 200 of these shy and beautiful cats remain. We have a management plan to save them. 
but it is dependent on continued and fresh support. Without it, we will surely see the Iberian lynx pass